Ladies and gentlemen, in the United States and the Republic of Korea, welcome to the Korea Defense Veterans Association's webinar series commemorating the 70th year since the start of the Korean War. I am Colonel Retired Steve Lee, the Senior Vice President of KDVA. I would like to provide short opening remarks before introducing our moderator, Lieutenant General Retired Bernard Champeau. KDVA is very excited to host this webinar because we believe the stories of our Korean War veterans and their families should not be lost to time. We believe that their stories remind us all why fighting the Korean War matters even today, 70 years later. During our discussion, we will cover three topics. Looking back on those who served and sacrificed during the war, including perspectives of families through the decades discussing why they think their service was worth fighting the war, and finally looking now at recognizing and honoring service members and their families. Before I introduce our moderator, I would like to very briefly cover the agenda. After opening remarks from General Champeau, we'll go to a moderated discussion with the three speakers and then open the floor for Q&A. Audience members can submit questions at any time during the Q&A using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. You can even do this now. I would like to ask that you keep the questions relevant to the topics and short, maybe one, two, three sentences. Please remember to direct the questions to somebody or say it's to all three panelists. Because we are streaming live across the globe, you might experience some temporary glitches, but that's okay. Usually they clear up in a matter of seconds. Also, this webinar will be on the kdva.vet digital library and the kdva youtube channel probably starting tomorrow so ladies and gentlemen i would like to introduce our moderator lieutenant general retired bernard champeau commanded eighth army in korea from 2013 to 2016. he is now the senior executive vice president of hanwha defense international the biggest south korean defense contractor and they are located in the washington dc area we are especially thankful to Hanwha for its long-term sponsorship and contributions to KDVA. General Shampoo also volunteers as a KDVA board member. But he is most proud of being the son of a World War II, Korean War, and Vietnam War veteran. I have known General Shampoo for over eight years while in Korea and while working in KDVA. He has a huge heart for the Alliance and for our veterans. And I am very thankful for the example that he and his family have set in supporting the Alliance. Through their example, I better understand what truly selfless service really means. So ladies and gentlemen, General Champeau, our moderator, sir. Well, good morning, uh, good evening and onyasio. Um, thank you, Steve, for the very kind introduction and for helping to organize this webinar like you have to all of the KDVA, KDVA events, you've poured your heart and soul into this, and we're all very grateful. And um, I'm also very grateful for this opportunity to participate in, the, in this webinar. Um, this is one of the most significant events that I am uh, so honored to be part of. And as Steve said, being the son of a Korean War veteran is very precious to me. And like so many other Korean War veterans, my father, Lieutenant Colonel, retired Francis L. Shampo, was very humble about his experiences in Korea. He didn't talk much about the war, and it wasn't until I became a fellow soldier that he would talk about the profession of arms with me and the challenges of leading and leading in combat. You know, I, I, my dad would have appreciated organizations like KDVA that continue to work hard to maintain a strong relationship and alliance with the Republic of Korea. And by being part of events like this, I learn more about the true, about what true service for a country and the Alliance really means. And I oftentimes feel closer to my father's legacy each time I meet a Korean War veteran. So my personal thanks to the 1,789,000 American men and women who served to defend the Republic of Korea. So this morning, I'm really excited to get this going. So let me introduce our very, very distinguished panel. 
Uh, first, Miss Sharon Ekstrom is the daughter of Robert Ekstrom, a Korean War veteran. Robert Ekstrom enlisted in the Marine Corps at Navy Pier in June 1948 and went through boot camp on Paris Island, like so many other Marines. He was part of the amphibious force with the 1st Marine Division as a radio operator that landed at the strategic port of Incheon and pushed inland to recapture Seoul. Later, Bob became one of the courageous frozen chosen or the chosen few who made it out of the chosen reservoir. Bob served two com Bob received two combat awards for valor for his actions in Korea and was later promoted to staff sergeant. Sharon is the youngest daughter of Mr. Mr. Exum's four children. She has worked in international logistics industry for 30 years as a U.S. Customs broker in Chicago and Atlanta. And in November 2014, she moved to Atlanta. She moved from Atlanta back to the Chicago area to help her parents, which turned into being a full-time job of caregiving. And sadly, uh, Mr. Bob Ekstrom passed away just this last March from Lewy body dementia complicated by Parkinson's. Our next panelist is Mr. Sal Scarlato, Korean War veteran. Sal served in the Naval Reserves from 1949 to 1951 before joining the United States Marine Corps. He was sent to Korea in 1952 and was stationed on the front lines above Panmunjom along the Jamestown line. He received many honors for his bravery, commitment, and sacrifices. As a civilian, he worked as a consultant for various companies such as Grumman Aircraft Company and IBM. In 1991, he dedicated his services to help all Korean War veterans that are in need, as well as created strong relationships with the Korean government and Korean communities in the United States. He is currently president of the Korean War Veterans Association, Department of New York, and president of Central Long Island Chapter 64. And finally, last but certainly not least, Lieutenant General Phil Shuttler, United States Marine Corps, retired Korean War veteran. General Shuttler graduated from the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis with the class of 1948. He retired in 1980. He was awarded the, the Distinguished Service Medal for Exceptionally Meritorious and Distinguished ser Service in a position of great responsibility to the government of the United States. General Shuttler served as a platoon leader and as a reconnaissance company commander in Korea. He was designated a Navy aviator in 1952 and served in various fighter and attack squadrons throughout his distinguished career before retiring in 1980 as a Director of Operations, the J3, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So again, good morning everyone, and I'd like to direct the first question to Mr. Scarlato. So where were your, what were your thoughts about Korea versus what it, it was when you arrived, the reality of what you saw when you arrived? Well, when I first arrived in Korea, <clears throat> I didn't realize uh, uh, the reality of war. You know, the only war thing that I ever saw was in the movies of World War II. And when we landed in Incheon, actually when we went on landing barge, landing craft, when the officer said land at departure, lock and load, uh, I started to shiver. And I says, oops. And on the way to uh, the MLR, uh, I, uh, we got hit with mortar fire and small arms and I landed in a rice paddy and it started to rain and I was all full of muck and I pulled a ricochet off my helmet I realized this is not a police action, this was a war. Well, as I was going to Korea, I always asked my superiors why and where we were going to Korea. And they always said to me, well, when you get to Korea, you're definitely going to find out. Well, I, long before, I uh, found out later on, but during that period of time, uh, I was in a lot of major battles. I, uh, be honest with everyone, I didn't like where I was. I didn't realize that what war could do to a human body. My first incident was 
when the CCF attacked us one night, when they blew the horn, blew the whistle, blew the horn, blew the bugle, and then they blew the whistle and attacked. Uh, a short timer next to me, he was only had a week to go, got hit a belly wound, and he landed on me. When he landed on me, naturally, I uh, sort of panicked a little bit, and I cried like a baby, and amongst, amongst other things. And that was my face in kind of a person being shot. And the corpsman came over and he says, give me a hand, put it on his belly. What I did, I put it on his belly and I had his, partially his liver in my hand. And I, I still didn't penetrate that uh, war as hell. And uh, I hated everybody. I really hated the Korean people. I really hated the uh, military. I hated myself for enlisting. And then uh, uh, things changed. Uh, I got I got hit, and it made it worse. I got hit with a grenade, and uh, I was on a hospital ship for four weeks. And I thought I was going home. But at that time, I didn't go home. I went back to my unit. Because the Marine Corps was kind of small. They only had one reinforced division. So while uh, I was on a hospital ship, again, in my mind, I just hated where I was. I hated war. But I had an incident, uh, if I may talk about it, uh, where uh, we were on patrol one time. We were on many patrols, and we came to a very, very small uh, village. And in this village, there were some uh, civilians that were, had their heads tied, and they were uh, executed. And off the side of the road, there was two women. They were passed away, and two little girls full of blood, and one little boy. Girls were, were not hurt. They were just blood from their parents. But the little boy's hand was blown off. So I rushed over to him, took my medical kit out, wrapped it. Corman came running over, and this little boy grabbed me and strangled me. Literally, literally strangled me. And he wouldn't let go, and he kept screaming. Well. We found out from one of the local area people that there was an orphanage not far from there. With a, he was a minister, but he was also a doctor. And uh, we got a, we flagged down a medical jeep, went into the medical jeep, and rode down to uh, this area. And uh, uh, as we approached it, we, we jumped out of the jeep. The corpsman took the two little girls, they were about six years old, took the two little girls inside. The girls were not hurt. The little boy, oh, by the way, I, before that, I took his hand and I put it in my pocket. So when we got to the, this orphanage, we finally got the little boy's hand off my neck and uh, he was crying constantly. And I left and I got into the Jeep and I remembered I had his whole hand in my pocket. Well, <clears throat> I went back in there to give the uh, doctor, uh, this minister, his hand. And when I gave him his hand, the little boy died. And when he passed away, it hit me so hard that when I returned to my area, I was sitting in the bunker, and I used to pray to guardian angels. I, I developed, uh, in my mind, a, a guardian angel. And I was talking to him, and after I had my uh, senses, that's when I dedicated myself, and I knew why I was there in Korea. I was there in Korea to help and save these people from communism and saved them from disasters, just what we just saw. And this little boy, all these children that 
a sufferer and it made me a better Marine. It made me understand that I was not only fighting for my survival, but I was fighting for a country to survive. And uh, that's, that's, that's burnt in my mind for the past 70 years. So actually 68 years for me. But, yes. Yes, Sal, th thank you so much for that, um, that very powerful um, story. You know, the, the intensity of combat is, is really hard to describe, and it's um, just as hard to anticipate. And I, I think many of us don't know how we're going to react. And, um, but uh, thank you for, for sharing that. Thank you very much. Um, for Ms. Ekstrom, yes. what were your family's views about the military? That might be helpful for other people to understand as a, as a the daughter of a Marine. How did, how did your family feel about the military? Um, they were very, they were pro-military. Um, oh. For the longest time, we never knew my dad was in a war. Um, we knew he was a Marine. It wasn't until later in life that we found out that he was a combat veteran and uh, while he was serving, his mother placed flags in her window in support of each son. She had three of five sons go into the into war, and she would save newspaper clippings and would write to them each one regularly. And I think for my father, uh, he always looked forward to receiving mail from home and wanting to know what's going on at home and um he knew that she was constantly praying for his safety and um for everyone's safety for that matter yeah uh, go ahead no, I just, I just want to thank you for the insight. You know, um, a lot of us don't have that kind of insight. And, um, you, know, you know, thank you for sharing that. Um, General Sutler, how, how did you stay in touch with your family and friends back home? I mean, were you able to hear from them? Were you able to communicate with them? Did they have any idea what was going on with you? And uh, have any, any appreciation of your health or safety? Or We, uh, we used to write a letter every day. And because they'd come in batches, we would number them for the week. <laughs> and they usually come four or five at a time. And you always had to look at, read them in the order because the problems of Monday might be gone by Wednesday. <laughs> and, uh, and we kept, uh, kept in touch that way. Though for a, I'm very sorry that I did not keep letters, but my wife did. So we have in our family archives a bunch of those letters from that time. And that happened in Vietnam also. We had, we were always writing letters back and forth. Yeah, to, you know, to this day, mail call is, is um, it, the most important part of the day for it is. sailor, airman, and marine. I mean, it's, uh, it is your connection back home. And, you know, the, the, um, you know, the soldier, sailors, airmen, and marine, and coast guardmen today have, you know, you know, almost immediate means to communicate back home. So it, it was a little different challenge back then, and um, yeah. Uh, but while I got you, um, General Sutler, what is a distinct memory or two that you that really st struck with you, uh, really stuck with you during your experience in Korea? I would I would like to say that the the overall memory was to recognize that very early on to us, uh, we really knew did know why we were there. Uh, they, uh, they communicated to us that, that uh, the reason that, that President Truman had gone there in the first place was to stop the, the drive of communism towards Japan. And that was a big mission. And that was, that was uh, big enough for most of us. But we knew really that, that uh, inside the Marine Corps, you're just fighting for your, your fellow Marines and, and Army as well. That's a, that's a common, common, grunt, common grunt feature. Yeah, you, ne you never want to let the Marine or soldier next to you down. It's, uh, it's what really drives us. 
Uh, Sal, how did the Korean War shape your future? How, how do you think it shaped your family's future? Well, at the beginning, we had a major problem, especially myself, because uh, when I got home, <clears throat> I wound up in the Naval Hospital and I received a medical discharge. And uh, one of the, naturally, with everybody else, the PTSD, uh, which they didn't call at that time, was very powerful. And when I first got home, uh, my parents, especially my dad, he couldn't uh, understand my condition. And uh, <clears throat> I had an uncle in, uh, <laughs> I had an uncle that was in World War II it was a POW for three years, and it was my mother's brother. And he came over a few times to uh, talk with me, which helped a lot, and also helped my family. You know, our views were, uh, we were on the same wavelength as far as uh, <clears throat> coping with my condition. And, uh, and when I first got married, uh, my wife, my lovely wife, we had a problem because I could not uh, uh, sleep with anyone. I could not uh, cope with uh, the situation. It took my wife three years. And she, when we first got married, she says, I'll take care of you. She says, we'll work something out. And we did. And uh, that's when the, the family got much closer. Uh, because we all cooperated with one another. Uh, as being the, uh, the sort of the patient, uh, like I said, I wasn't myself. I was only 20 years old at the time, and uh, my, rea my reality was uh, very, very low. But uh, my family, if it wasn't for my family, I think uh, I don't know what I would have done. Uh, plus, I was also going to the VA for certain type treatments. But uh, if it wasn't for the family, I don't think I'll be here today. So they also were educated, as I was educated, to help me. Yeah, thanks, Sal. Thanks for sharing that. Um, it does have a big impact on, on us, obviously, and, and the, the ones that we come home to. Can I add to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for my father, when he came home in, well, he got out of the service in 52. Um, he met my mom. Uh, and they had, were walking on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. Somebody lit off a firecracker and down went my dad. He went to the ground. And there were many, many episodes where he, just went, got low because of a loud noise, you know. Um, they were laying in bed one night, a truck came down the street and backfired and off the bed he went onto the floor. And that's something that we all had to, even throughout my life, we all had to learn to accept and appreciate and uh, kind of just go with the flow with him, you know, when his memories came out. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a certain resilience that's required uh, to bounce back and uh, to face each day after these uh, you know these events um, that we witness in combat. Um, so yeah, thank thank you for sharing that, uh, General Sutler. What kind of interested in what motivated you to to um, seek an appointment at at the Naval Academy and after your experiences in uh, Korea, which is soon after graduation, but why did you decide to make a career of it? Or did you decide? Is it something that, that uh, I mean, what, what kind of drove you to, to commit yourself in your, your adult yeah. life to service? I, I went to the Naval Academy as a result. Remember, we were a depression family, and to go to college at all was pretty, pretty dicey. And so the possibility of going to the Naval Academy seemed to way out of my family, so that's what I did. And when I was in the Academy, I met a, a Lieutenant Colonel of Marines who was just super. 
And when he said, would you like to join the Marine Corps? I had no other choice. And uh, but Flynn, from the time I grew up, this was the time of the barnstormers and the, and the airplanes. And, and, uh, and I went and saw one of those barnstormers and I knew them from that point I had to fly. And I wasn't going to for a while in the Marine Corps, but then after the Korean War that opened up and they did send me to flight training. And after, after that, when you're flying, they, you wonder why are they paying you? Because you'd pay them to do what you're doing. <laughs> and and uh, anyway, so the so the uh, that's that's what kept me in at those stages. Yeah. Thank you, it, Sal. What what were the what were the one or two things that you really missed uh, while you were away? I mean, other than your family, I mean, it was a, what 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 did you really miss when you had the opportunity to? Get a little homesick and uh, think about you know things back home. Well, everyone knows they miss home. That's obvious. Uh, what I really missed was hanging out on the corner. In my time, in my era, if you know history, in Brooklyn they had all gangs. You know, no social clubs, but gangs, and we were called the Cloak and Dagger Boys. And uh, you, you, uh, you sure you want to continue? You sure you want to continue with this? I, I guess the statute of limitations are probably over. It might be might be safe. Yeah. No, no, it's very safe. <laughs> <laughs> what what I missed, I'll be honest, it was we was we used to stand on the corner and watch all the girls go by, and we used to whistle at them and act stupid, if you know what I mean. So uh, uh, that used to always pop in my mind. I said, why am I sitting in this bunker looking at a rat? We had a rat named Henry. <laughs> I could be on a corner watching all the girls go by. I knew that it was a song. Frank Sinatra used to sing that, standing on a corner watching all the girls go by. So that used to, every time I mentioned that with my colleagues, my Marines, a few guys did the same thing in Chicago or wherever, but the Southerners didn't do that. For some reason, they were more farmers. So they were kind of impressed that when we used to chat about it, and they used to call us, uh, well, I can't say what they used to call us, but uh, it, it was, uh, there were other things. There were, you know, you miss your family, you miss your girlfriend, and uh, you want to be home. Uh, like I said, and you want to go to the beach. We used to love to go to the beach in Coney Island. But these are the things that goes through your mind. And, you know, and it, it was very, that's why I said when at the beginning, I, I created in my mind a guardian angel. And I used to consult probably every day. I used to, well, I used to pray. I was not religious, but I used to pray for every God, every nationality, religion, that was on earth, because I wanted to survive. I wanted to go home, you know, and uh, when them... Uh, there, there's, that, there's that old old truth in the saying that there are, there are no atheists in the Foxhole. No, no. If they are, they won't. If they are, they are wrong, definitely, because everyone... Not, not, not for long. Everyone, uh, General Sutler, what... How about you? What... I mean, what... What did you really long for, or miss, um, when you were? Well, we, primarily, we missed family, and uh, the letters every day helped. Uh, even if, if we knew there was going to be one every day, and that that made a big difference. And we know that we, if we didn't get one for four days, we we're going to be four of us waiting on the next mail call. And uh, the, um, I think that that we sort of got deprived of food. We had what we had in rations. And every now and then we'd get out of that, and I remember how great it was to have a steak every now and then. And when we were flying later, uh, we'd get to go in R and R, and they'd have a chance to get a, a nice meal in Japan. We were uh, flying in Korea right after the war, and the same conditions of relative hardship appeared. And so I guess I would say I missed the steak, as well as the family, of course. Yeah. Sure. I I noticed your dad's. Uh brain and awards over your uh, right shoulder. And I think that's his picture, best I can tell. It is. 
so obviously there's a visual daily lasting memory of your dad but how was your family influenced by his by his service and more um actually i happened upon these awards um ribbons i i'm not sure the military name for each one but um they were kept in a box and i just happened to come across them and i put them in the shadow box so once i got that hung up and when he was ill and we had to call paramedics over to the house i took great pride that i actually had that hanging up on the wall because our the paramedics fire department were in awe and it just made me proud you know my father's service and to the country of korea even though he didn't know where it was in the beginning um and i started to like enter him into parades you know and he just went with the flow he had never been in a parade to as a military you know as a veteran um and this town of arlington heights they had a hearts of gold contest where you submit an email and never did i think my dad would win for the heroic category but he did and they had a, a benefit in his name um, and we all attended as a family and we were all so proud and he got a huge standing ovation and not a dry eye in my family um that's we were really just extremely, extremely proud of him for what he endured. It's what we learned later in life, you know, and going back to um, Phil's, the question for Phil, I think for dad, he had lost 25 pounds um, by the time they entered Seoul. And he wrote a letter home, which we have, and he said, nothing that good steak and some sleep will take, you know, put the pounds back on. So he, I think what he missed was family and warm food. <laughs> Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I, I'd now like to uh, go to some of the questions from our audience. And as it turns out, we have a distinguished retired soldier who sent a, a, a note in, a question in, he's served in Korea um, as an operations officer, in fact, uh, in 8th Army. And it's uh, Brigadier General Retired uh, William King. And he, he first wants to thank you for your service and continued representation of that, of that devotion of duty and selfless service. Uh, but his question is, how are you helping today's generation understand and appreciate those characteristics and values? And how can we help you further accomplish that? Sal, you wanna, you wanna tackle that first? Sure. <clears throat> Just to give you an example, in, uh, we formed in 85, and my chapter formed in 89. And <clears throat> the first, uh, what we came up with, we called Tunnel America Program. We did this in 1995 or 94. What we do is we go to high schools, right? and uh, we try to go for two years seniors and try to explain to the to the student not too much combat but the reality of war the reason of war and what the outcome of war is okay and then our military stories mostly the good parts and while we did this it was very successful matter of fact the Korean government also gave us pamphlets to do this but what happened was is these children graduate high school and you don't see them no more. And then you get another match. So what we decided, my chapter decided that we're gonna do uh, libraries. We're gonna attack libraries. So we made arrangements with five libraries in Long Island. What we try to do is educate the parents of the student. 
not individually, but generality. And we did, because the public library has a lot of things, and a lot of people go there. My, our first session, we had 150 people. Our second session was that. Then I hooked up with another group, and I had 500 students. This is all a Telemerica program. And, and it brings out, and we also did churches, especially Korean churches, because a lot of Korean uh, youngsters do not know nothing about their history of the Korean War. So we went to churches, youth centers, and we still do. We're, we're up in age now, but we still go. The only co the colleges did not accept us too much because they didn't want to get involved in the military. And we, we always tell them, we're not recruiters. We're just here to tell stories about the forgotten war and the forgotten victory. Because no matter where you go, you always hear the politicians say, World War II, Vietnam. It was never Korea. And many a times I embarrassed myself and I yelled, excuse me, sir, how about the Korean War? And then they mumble, oh yeah, you're right. So, you know, that upsets a lot of Korean War veterans and that makes us better teachers. We're not teachers. You understand what I'm saying? We went there just to tell stories. And uh, when we first go and we talk to the principal or the history teacher, we explain to them we're not recruiters. We're just here to tell about the, the series of the Korean War and, 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 our, and our military uh, <clears throat> experiences. Like I said, yeah, in the military right. experience, we always try just to do the fun part. You know, there's always a fun part. Yeah, thanks, Sal. General Sutler, sir, do you have anything, any thoughts on that question? Well, uh, thought? my, <clears throat> my thoughts on that, how did I become involved? After I retired, we gave a course at National Defense University in which we emphasize the use of military shields and and the military defense of a, of, of a non-fighting situations. And I try to teach that the military is the shell. And in Korea, you really can see the shell right along the DMZ. And that shell exists and it's been there without fighting for 70 years. Well, not 70, about, about 65 or so. And, and the function of the military when they're not fighting is to provide this shell of decency inside of which decent people will be decent and for whatever it's worth that shell extends now not only in korea but all the way across the the, the globe uh, countries that are affiliated with the united states can and we have not gone to conquer but we have provided a shell inside of which they will develop and can develop and have developed so this is much uh, sort of a my contribution to understand that. Yeah, yeah fantastic. And, it, and it, it is the miracle on the on the hunt. And through the, you know, the blood and, and uh, sacrifice of both uh, Korean and, and American warriors. And, uh, you know, you know, Sal, to your point, you know, we, we mobilized for World War II. We had a draft for the Vietnam War. And uh, the, the Korean War was, you know, after World War II, it was, it was a war to end all, end all wars. And I think as Americans, we we're a little fatigued. And the idea that we we're gonna involve in another conflict, um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was hard to um, embrace that. And you're right, it, it was forgotten. And it's not unlike a little bit today with an all volunteer force, you know, less than 1% of America's sons and daughters serve in uniform. And so I, I think it's uh, both yours and General Sutler's efforts to um, demonstrate not just by your example, but by your engagement, um, you know, what, what the military uh, does and is about and, uh, and the character that it develops in us, I think is, is important. Your examples, I, you know, I applaud both of your examples. Um, Sharon, can, can you, did your dad ever talk about um, what was the first thing he wanted to do when, uh, you know, when he found out that he was coming home? You know, you'd mentioned the, the steak dinner and all, but I mean, did, it, did he ever share with um, you the, the excitement and, and, you know? He did not talk about that. There was not, mm, he just didn't, he wasn't uh, very forthcoming in 
how he felt about things. I'm sure he looked forward to going home as anybody would in that situation. Um, he just wanted to get home, see his family and see his friends and because he lost a lot of friends in Korea. Um, yeah, Je General Sutler, sir. I, I think that, that one of the things that very late in life that I understood that, that nobody that's in combat walks away without some scars and they never talk about those scars until years later. And, and they don't want to face them. They don't remember them, really. And they're, they're uh, we talk about whatever post uh, traumatic, this, 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 sorry, PTSD. And, uh, and, and it's everybody has it, everybody that's been in combat. And they won't talk about those things. And, and over and over again, you'll hear this story from our youngsters, and mine the same. And I'm sort of telling them, but a lot of the stuff I don't tell, I can't tell. And so it's a, I think that's one of the things as we view veterans, anybody that's been in combat, it, they don't have to be disabled by it, but they've got a lot of things that they're not going to show. Yes, Al? All right. What was the question? <laughs> well, uh, General Sutler, um, kind of spun off of that, but um, it, what, what, what were your first thoughts when you found out you were, you were coming home? What was it? Well, my first thought, I just have to say, the week of when I was supposed to come home, we got hit very bad on a hill called Vegas. Matter of fact, the 5th fifth, fifth Marines lost a lot of men, the 7th had to go up, all Marines were just on the front line. So I was sitting in a bunker about 2.30 in the morning, 3.30 in the morning. A sergeant came in and says, okay. And he, he rattled off three names. He says, you're going home. Well, let me tell you something. I was, I ran out of the bunker so fast that they had to stop me because I didn't know where I was going because it was pitch black. They says, you got to get your gear. I left my weapon. I left my helmet. I left my butt, my, my weapon, uh, 782 gear. He says, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. I don't want to know nothing. I said, I was glad. I was so happy because we were, we got hit very, very bad. Matter of fact, that battle was the, one of the worst battles the Marines had. And that was 1953. So my thoughts coming home was astronomical. It was fabulous. And that's all I was thinking on the way. And we went to <clears throat> Ashcom City. Usually you stay there four or five days. We stood there five hours and right on the ship. We were right on the ship. We went on the ship just the way we were. Filthy, dirty, uh, not, not with our weapons. We just with our 782 gear and our helmet, we dropped our weapons off and we were on a ship on the USS Gordon. And that's yeah, I, yeah, thanks, Al. Um, just so I didn't, I didn't want to gloss over your comments. I, I think you realize, today, even today, our our young um, warriors have a difficult time coping, and uh, unfortunately, sometimes it's expressed in um, you know by by taking their lives, and it's a it's a you know, it's um, it, it it's it, it's really hard to. To witness, it's hard to know um, that it's very difficult to reconcile some of these experiences that uh, that they were uh, that that were visited during combat. Um, so I, you know, I didn't want to I didn't want to gloss over that. It is you know for all of us that have that have seen the horrors of combat, it's uh, it becomes a part of us. Um, for our family members that have witnessed the horrors and experience wars of combat, the challenges of combat. Um, you know, we see it in our loved ones and it becomes part of our lives too. And uh, I think your open and honest comments about it and uh, sharing your two about, about your dad's experiences uh, post-combat are, are important for the rest of, uh, of Americans and Koreans to understand. 
um, that it, that it's it's something that never leaves you, it never leaves your 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 soul, your experience, and it and it's always a part of your of your of your family. Now the good news is, you know, we are resilient, and we find ways uh, to help each other, find ways to help ourselves, and um, I think it's important for Americans to appreciate that. So uh, thank you so much for sharing it. So what 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 did you think? Um, when you were younger, you know, be before you joined the Naval Reserves, how, how did you think you would spend your youth? Well, when I was younger, I wanted to be a cowboy. I you're from Brook, Sal. You're from Brooklyn. <laughs> just have to remind I'm from you. Brooklyn, New York, the best state in the union. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, well, when I was growing well, unless up, unless I'm unless I'm mistaken, there aren't a lot of cowboys that have come out of Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> I know. Well, <laughs> that was my. <clears throat> that was my desire. But then I also wanted to be a pilot. Me and my brother, my older brother was a World War II vet. We loved planes. And the reason I joined the Naval Air Reserve, I was only 16 years old. We forged our papers because my brother was very into uh, political stuff. He was five years older than me. And to keep me out of the Korean War, because he knew something was going to happen, that's why he made me join the Naval Air Reserve. But we loved planes. We used to build models. We used to uh, fly them. So we had a lot in common with that. With it. I, want, I could not be a pilot. I didn't have the education, plus I wore glasses at the time. So that's why we joined the Naval Air Reserve. Actually, I wanted to go to the Marines. And my brother conned me when we went to Floyd Bennett Field. There were two sections of squadrons. One was the Marine Reserve and one was the Navy. Being the older brother, he says, we're going to the Navy because he was in the Navy. He was a SEAL in the World War II, uh, actually UDT man. So uh, my, my real desire was to be a pilot. But before that, I wanted to be a cowboy, like every, every young boy growing up. And we used to go a lot of horseback riding along the beach in the Coriano area. But uh, my dream didn't come true. Because when I got married, my wife says, we're not having a ranch. We're not going to Montana. We're not going to Wyoming. So uh, my dream was, uh, but actually when I joined the Corps, I wanted to make a career out of it. I wanted to, uh, me and my wife, well, she was my girlfriend at the time. And I decided I'm going to stay in the Corps. But my wounds didn't tell me that I'd wind up in the Naval Hospital for five months. And they, you know, gave me a medical discharge. Did, um just got another question, and Del Sutler, I don't, I don't, I don't know if you uh, flew out of Korea, but the but the question really is directed for all three of you. If uh, if Sharon, if your father had any recollection, but the, the question is, uh, what what was it like on the docks when your ship uh, pulled in and disembarked uh, from Korea? Were there crowds? Um, you know, what 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 was it like when you uh, departed Korea? When we went to Korea? No, when you, when you departed. When we left Korea? No, no, we left by, by air. And there were two or three of us just came back on orders. We were on our orders back to flight training. And there was one other guy with me. And we, we just we departed as just almost commercially. We, we were down in the south by that time in Maison. And I believe they had air flights out of, out of Busan. Busan and back to Korea, back to Japan. And so we first just, in about, a, in about a day, it happened almost like so. The orders came in and, and uh, you had one day to choose and I almost didn't choose flight training, but uh, we had enough, enough people in the company by that time that I wasn't really. And, and, and Sal, your, your departure, did you, did you also Fly out of Busan, or, or no, were there? No, 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 no. I didn't have that privilege. I had to spend <laughs> 14 days on a trip. When it, well, we when we left Korea, like I said, we we looked terrible. We had to get uniforms that didn't fit us, and so when we stopped in Kobe, Japan, we stopped in Sasebo, Japan. So on the way home, that's where we stopped. We got some gear together so we could have decent clothes 
in order to get out in San Francisco. So when we hit San Francisco, uh, there was a band, an army band, because we had 1,200 Marines and 1,200 army personnel. Now, when I first went over, we had 4,500 Marines. Now, the same Marines were supposed to come home about the same time, but there was only 1,200 of us. So when we got to San Francisco, we had a band, and I, I, they had a, 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 I think it was Kay Smith singing God Bless America when we died. Wow. <laughs> but the, the erotic part is when we hit Treasure Island, there was a colonel that was in charge. And uh, he stood on this big pedestal. He looked like a giant. <laughs> and he said, Marines, you're here. You're under my care. You could do anything you want except rape and murder. I'll get you in any jam. You're gonna spend five days with me, and five days you're gonna get the best care in the world. And he did. Everyone treated us uh, like we were all, all equal kings. I don't care if you were an officer or you were a private, everyone got the same treatment. And that was his philosophy. And believe me, because Marines, you gotta remember, we hit the United States uh, we did not go straight home. We had to spend five days or six days in Treasure Island. We got liberty every day, and they only gave us $100 because they didn't give us no back pay because a lot of Marines either get mugged or <clears throat> spend their money very foolishly. So he says that you're going to spend it for, you have to spend $20 a day. Well, $20 a day in 1953 went pretty long way, but. So uh, <clears throat> he made sure, and to make it even better, <clears throat> he did not, <clears throat> excuse me, did not give us our plane ticket. We got the plane ticket at the airport. A sergeant took a bus loaders to the airport, made sure we got on a plane to go home. But it was a great experience. It was an experience in the, that you only see in one lifetime. Yeah. Um Sharon, did, did your father share any of his experiences, either departing or returning? <laughs> You're talking about um, oh, sure. He took a boat from Kobe to San Francisco. Uh, I don't know which one, but this would, would have been in 50, the end of 51. Um, I'm assuming he had liberty at that time, and uh, I know when he, when he was near Seoul at one point, they had, I don't know, a day or two of R&R, &R, and they were playing touch football. He got elbowed in the mouth, and his <laughs> teeth cracked. So at towards uh, when he was in Basan, they pulled his two front teeth, and he still had eight more months of guerrilla warfare, and he's a radio operator. Now he's talking without his two front teeth. So when he headed to San Francisco, he just wanted to get to the dentist and get his partial. And that's all he spoke about. He just wanted his teeth. Yeah, um, question on, you know, how, how, did, how did my father's uh, service in Korea affect how I, how I view South Korea today. And um, I was a soldier for nearly uh, 39 years. It was 38 years, 10 months, and 28 days. But no one was counting except my wife, Mary Susan, towards the end. Um, but my, my, after those nearly four decades, my, and I think it was divine providence, my last assignment was to serve in Korea. And um, I eventually was able to um, walked the same train with some of my family that my uh, that my father the train that my father fought on up in Chorwon, um, and um, he, some of this was written in a book where he was mentioned. But but the the that impact and my my connection that I had since I could remember, um, my father didn't talk a lot about the, the Korean War, but he had brought mementos home that were in the house. They were Korean masks and some, and some brass pots. And, um, so 
so so it was always always kind of uh, you know part of my life but it wasn't until i actually served there um got to know and love the the korean people that it's um it, it's really it's my second home it's but part of my heart remains day in and day out and uh, a connection that um you know started over you know, 70 years ago so thanks for that question i um i think i don't know if any of you have returned i know sal you've been back a few times general sutler i don't know if you've returned um or sharon if you've had the opportunity for the the korean government graciously has a, a visitation program where they i've never seen anything like it in the world the ministry of patriots and veterans affairs which is uh, similar to our vet our va um the korean government uh, pays for uh, veterans and their families to return to korea as a as a small measure to thank them um, I, I when i was there i was invited to speak and to participate in some of the, the dinners and luncheons and parades that they had, uh, military reviews that they had. Um, it was one of the most powerful things I've seen. Um, so I don't know if any of you have experienced that, if you wanted to share, um, share General Sutler. The, uh, I've had a chance to go back a number of times. And uh, the, uh, the, I, I would tell you the first time I went back, I was still on active duty and, and uh, in 1978 and by that time Korea had really started to change and when people found out that I was there in 1950 they would meet us on the street and there would be tears immediately in their eyes and so going back to Korea is a is a very much an emotional experience always and I've been back a number of times on that program that you had of their there are various speaking engagements and so on that that invited me back and I did that and so every time we've taken a different one of our kids back with us and they become just as enthused as, as everybody else. And, and uh, the appreciation, the appreciation they have for the U.S. reflects in me that I appreciate them in exactly the same way. They represent now an extension of the United States ideals far across the world, but in great strength. And, uh, and the uh, DMC represents the shell of decency inside of which they're operating and they're reinforcing us when they do that. Uh, Chair Nassau? Yes, uh, I've been back uh, to Korea eight times wow. and uh, not too much uh, with the re revisit program. I was on a lot of special events. I had gone back by congressmen, you know, from the Blue House. I have been decorated three times by three different presidents. The most honorable thing actually was always the Koreans bow to us and always say thank you to uh, saving their country. But when you have a president of a country on a platform and then you an award and then bow to you and say thank you for saving my country. Do you know how my chest was? It was way, way out. I felt so honored and proud. Like I said, I'm very, very involved with the Korean community here in the United States, but also very, very involved with the Korean government in Seoul, Korea. And uh, one time in, in 2010 or 2016, I was in Seoul. We were in the heart of Seoul, okay? And uh, it was about one o'clock in the morning and me and two other colleagues, he says, you know, I'm back in New York. Everything was lit. The whole area was completely lit. Now, the Korean government has a, a, an unwritten rule that every store owner, every highway has lights. Because when you do an aerial view, that's all you see is lights. And that's in North Korea, you're going to see darkness. So they... Uh, the Korean people accept what they have and they enjoy life. Now, I always stood at the uh, Lido Hotel. Now, in the Lido Hotel, there's a big uh, plaza right in front of it. And every night, it's like uh, being on uh, 
Tuesday night and night, where there's a tremendous aspect uh, uh, All these young people, all hours of the night, singing, playing instruments, and dancing, and the whole place is lit up. Like, they don't care. And they say, we're going to live our life the way it is. And I've been treated honorably, respectfully, with the Korean government and the Korean people and the Korean churches and the Korean multiple, multiple organizations. You know, the Korean people, what they do is when they meet, uh, they'll think of an idea in their formal corporation. They'll have senior citizens, uh, over 90 organizations, they have so many different organizations. And I know just about every one of us here in the metropolitan area. Uh, my dedication started in 1990 when I first met my first South Korean in the United States. It was kind of weird because we put a monument up, the first monument in Suffolk County. And every Sunday, <coughs> it was two monuments. It was a, um, a soldier and a map of Korea. And every Sunday, there was a bouquet of flowers on there. And I live about five minutes from there. So one Sunday I happened to pass, I spot this young man. I go approach him and it was a South Korean. His name was Kuhu Park. And through him and another fellow, John Ha, I must have met 10,000 South Koreans in my career, which made me very famous with the Korean community. And also the Korean government. I have known many uh, uh, presidents, uh, at least four that I have met. I have known about seven, six different uh, congressmen that I have met here in, in the United States and in Washington. Uh, I have met a lot of South Koreans. And uh, matter of fact, tomorrow, I'm going to meet the Consul General. We're going to the Long Island State Veterans Home where there's 100 Korean War vets, and they're going to dedicate uh, gowns to, uh, to this hospital. That's great. Sal, it's a the perfect way to end it and a perfect way to reflect on how important this relationship is and uh, how important the, the appreciation of, of the Korean people, what it means to us and uh, how it continues to strengthen the alliance, it, which is really important. I think a lot of people fail to realize that, um, you know, there's, there's just a ceasefire. And uh, so, you know, we have to remain vigilant. We have to, we have to keep this uh, relationship strong keep the alliance strong and your stories um i think are part of that and um i just i can't thank you enough can i open up open up your heart and and your and uh, sharing your memories um uh, all three of you um just uh, fantastic i'm so honored to be part of this so um can i Bill Sutler, sir thank you uh, mr scarlata thank can you so I add much something? can i add something to that we're just about out of time. It's uh, okay. quick. Okay. Okay. Do that. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, th th there'll be other opportunities. Yeah, I hope you continue to with with the same kind of vigor. You know, share your experiences and your and your thoughts in your community and and every opportunity that all three of you get. Now, it's important. It, it really is important that we not forget. Yeah. Um, I know you'll never forget, but we as Americans, uh, don't forget. forget because freedom is not free. So, um, you know, thank, thank you, uh, General. Thank you, Sal. Thank you, Sharon, for your time, for your time preparing for this, for what you've done in service of our country and, uh, and the way you've led, lived your lives uh, since. Um, as you know, this will resonate for years to come. KDVA has a digital library that these will, these will be posted and also the KDVA uh, YouTube channel. Um, the, I've been asked to remind folks with a short programming note that the annual Korean War Memorial Ceremony at the Korean War Memorial in Washington, D.C. will start this afternoon at 13.30, 30 this afternoon. Um, and you can uh, watch it live on the K KDBA uh, Facebook. So again, thank you all so much. May God continue to bless the United States of America, the Republic of Korea, and our alliance. Thank you. Simple. Come Thank you. Come Thank you.